everyone. Hi. Hello. I, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dinata. I'm the curator of film at the uh, Speed Art Museum. I want to welcome you uh, to today's uh, discussion of the documentary of My Rembrandt. It's available for rental. Uh, through the Speed's uh, virtual cinema platform. And I wanna thank uh, Strand Releasing, particularly Marcus Hu, uh, for connecting us uh, with the director of the, the film and setting up uh, today's event here. And then over the weekend, we had a very special in-person uh, screenings uh, for the Speed Cinephile Group, the Charter Collectors and the International Benefactor Circle. Uh, and it was fantastic to be able to see this film uh, projected in the cinema just as a way that uh, uh, we should be seeing films. Um, and uh, we were able to present that, you know, socially distanced and, uh, and in a safe manner. So, but it was great to have that opportunity to show the film just as the way it should, should be. Uh, I was really drawn to this film too because of the great connections uh, all through uh, uh, um, uh, between the between the film and uh, the speed, particularly because of the uh, speed having the Rembrandt uh, portrait of a forty year old woman, which came into the collection. Uh, from community donations uh, to mark the Speed's uh, 50th anniversary in 1977. And uh, because the International Benefactors uh, Circle had made a trip uh, to Europe in, uh, in uh, or two years ago, and, met, and members of the IBC group had met Jan Six, who is, uh, is featured within the, the film too. So today uh, we have the film's director, Uka Hugendrich, uh, uh, who is well known for her documentaries uh, on the New Rijksmuseum, uh, which is a four part TV series and a feature film. We have Jan Six, who is one of the youngest members of the six uh, aristocratic family and a prominent art dealer and the art detective uh, who is featured in the film. And we also have Irka Holmquist Wall, who is the Marion Barry Bingham Senior, a curator of European and American painting and sculpture. So I want to start uh, with a question for you, Uka, too. How did this project start? Uh, that's an important question. <laughs> I, I, I met the, the family six. First, I met the father of Jan, who's here now today. And um, he told me about the painting and I got very fascinated by his story. And then I wanted to meet the son. And he, at that moment, Jan was giving a lecture in Amsterdam by chance. And I had a very small camera and I went there and filmed his lecture and introduced myself to Jan. And then I was even more excited because Jan was telling me about uh, what he was doing. And I, from that moment off, I knew it, there would be a film in it because having a character like Jan in your film, knowing that he's, he's on the hunt for paintings, knowing that he has so much knowledge about Rembrandt, uh, and then he's very handsome and he's very eloquent. So I, I couldn't go wrong. And then I started to look for, <laughs> to look for other uh, main characters and met the Duke of Buccleuch in his castle in Scotland. And that was also very, very thrilling. And Baron de Rothschild, it was like, uh, it, was, it was so much fun to do, you know, to meet all these people that you normally don't meet and that have a Rembrandt in their homes. So that's quite particular, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So were you aware that there would be uh, two paintings that would be authenticated that were featured in the documentary when you began the film? Uh, no, I had no clue. When I met Jan, he, mm -hmm. he told me uh, by secret that he had found one Rembrandt that he was at that moment restoring. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was kind of, when I met him, I, I felt that he, he it wouldn't be only one. <laughs> and he had the idea that there will be more coming up. And, and so it did. So, but I didn't know whether it would have been 10 or 
And just one other one, but, but I knew it would be exciting like it was. <laughs> yes. I have a question for both of you. Um, the, the process of authentication in the film had to be handled pretty discreetly, um, but it was also being document, fully documented by a film crew. How do you feel that the presence of the camera, both from director and star, um, you know, how do you feel the presence of the cameras affect the process? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> um, at times it was a bit difficult because other people, well, I was, I started getting used to it. So effectively I started ignoring it <laughs> because you, you're so occupied with what you're doing that you sort of lose track of it. But other people um, didn't. So you could sense that sometimes it, it, it was an influence. But um, I think, you know, uh, most of the people that were filmed in that process understood that this was a bigger thing. It wasn't about that moment. It was about, it, in the end, it was really about Rembrandt. And I think they all knew uh, that Uke was filming and they all knew that Uke is a very um, sophisticated filmer. So it's not some documentary, it's, it will be a very good documentary. So I think that everybody understood that it, it also was a project, aside from the authentication, it was a project on its own. And uh, I think everybody understood that it needed to remain a bit secretive. Yes. Yeah. Which yeah. helped. And of course, I promised Jan uh, in every way I could that, that we wouldn't come out with anything until he got out to the press and media. Mm -hmm. So we had that deal also that, that we really, also my crew, that we all had to be very silent about it, which we did. Yeah. Good. Your documentary work, uh, particularly uh, your documentary, the New Rocks Museum, gave gave you incredible access to the workings of a museum and the proper handling of great works of art. My Rembrandt takes us into the homes of people who also own uh, priceless works in their collection, but it's not being handled with the same sort of care. Uh, how did you restrain yourself when people were moving paintings without gloves or pres prescribed protocols for handling precious work? That, that's a fun question because <clears throat> to be honest, I didn't have to restrain myself because <laughs> in my mind was the idea that in the old days, paintings mm -hmm. were in people, people's houses. And museums are only here for some time, but weren't there always. So, so, uh, and especially in the case of the Duke of Buccleuch, yeah. it was very interesting, the process he went through, because in the beginning, he was very scared of taking, taking the painting out of the frame. He was really like, but in the end, he was walking with the painting and it, it felt like some kind of therapy for him to get so close to his painting. And to be honest, I mean, only maybe the last, sequence in the film when he's putting it above a fireplace that might have surprised some people. But he also did it a bit because we asked him. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, because it was a wonderful shot for the film. No, but I think that in the, in fact, if you look for instance at the painting of Baron de Rothschild, the two paintings, the wedding paintings of Martin and Oak, they were really covered with nicotine because they, his parents, and I don't know him about him, but they have been smoking all their lives. But then when it was restored by Patria Noble of the Rijksmuseum, she told me that is the best way to keep a painting because when you take it up, okay, it's black, but the painting underneath, the paint is still there. But I think Jan knows a lot more about this than I do. Yeah. Well, the one thing I can say, I, I, I'm not really sure if it's in the movie, but when we, when we decided to hang the portraits of a young man at the Hermitage in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. um, very early in the morning, we got into a taxi with the painting and we drove to the museum and we took it in a box inside. <laughs> and then uh, we put it in a room because they wanted to take it out of the frame to inspect it for a condition report. And uh, the curator there said, this is going to take some time. So maybe you want a cup of coffee, etc." So we went off and I think Uka was there already starting to set up the cameras. And then we got back and there were about 20 or 25 journalists 
all waiting eagerly for this picture to come up. And so I was standing there waiting. I had no idea. And after about 20 minutes, everybody was sort of looking at everything. But in the room where we were all standing was just the frame with the glass, but not the picture. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of leaned forward to this empty frame and I blew a bit, uh, blew a bit of the dust away. And people started taking photographs. <laughs> it was very <laughs> surreal. And then I looked to everybody and I said, what are we doing here? <laughs> and then somebody whispered in my ear, I said, I don't know, maybe there's a bit of a problem in the back. And I said, oh my God, what's the problem? So I went to the other room and there was a curator with white gloves, sort of sweating from his forehead okay. with the picture on, on a table waiting. And I said, what's going on? And he said, I, I don't know how to carry this. He was so scared. And I said, mm -hmm. it's very simple. You yeah. take it with two hands, mm -hmm. bring it up, <laughs> put it in the frame. And then he said, I'm not going to do that. And I said, well, you know, I've been here now for an hour and I need to go to my work because I have work to do. So I'm going to do it right now. So I took it with two hands and I just walked out there and put it in the frame. And those are the photographs that all the news agencies used. But for me, it is so normal to, to work with hands-on because you have to move a picture, you have to put it in a frame. And afterwards I thought, oh, maybe that was a little bit too direct. <laughs> you don't kiss your Rembrandt like Mr. Kaplan. No, no. <laughs> and, and, and I think he's also partially said it because it was a woman. And I think uh, I do like the portrait of a gentleman, but I don't fancy him. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking, you know, just kind of uh, speaking of you know, Mr. Kaplan, uh, um, how how you know how did you develop the relationships with these private collectors to discuss their paintings? You know, I, as a curator, for me to see the interior of the Rothschild home and the Duke of Buccleuch, I mean, that's just like, oh my gosh, these are places you don't normally get access to. So they're very very private people. So how, how easy or difficult or, or what, I mean, was it? Well, I must say that I was very privileged because, because I made the film in the, about the Rex Museum for 10 years, I, I knew the people very well. So I asked Taco Dibitz, the, the director, please give me an introduction to those people because he knew them. So this is how it started that I wrote a letter and, it, and the Taco wrote a letter, Taco Dibitz, and then it's, a, then it's a matter of, which I'm used to because I'm a documentary making maker, going there, having a lot of uh, cups of tea, talking really, I mean, making a connection, which I love. It's a part of my work I love most is, is getting close to people and really showing that you're interested and, and that you're open and that you really know what it's about so that they, that they feel at ease with you. And I, I always put a lot of uh, effort into that. And I, I mean, I love it. That's, but I was lucky to have that introduction by Taco Dibis because otherwise I, I would have been much higher, I guess. Yeah, well, it really shines through the relationship that you've I, developed with them. I love that, that's a big It compliment. really comes through. Thank you. So Uka, the, the cinematography uh, within this film really allows us uh, to see some in incredible details of the paintings too. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with the cinematographers too and the discussions that you may have had in setting this up? Well, um, we've, it's the same cameraman that I had with the new Rijks Museum. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're really very used to, to work together. So we, and we know we just don't want to film a painting as a flat surface. We don't want that. We actually, would, what we love to do, what we aim to do is to make it come alive, the painting. So that's why he's always going very close with his camera, which is scary for the owners sometimes <laughs> because they see the camera so close to the painting. But um, in this case, we, I mean, we, we work like this. So, the, f the fact is that when I saw the painting of the Duke of Buccleuch in an exhibition in the Rijks Museum afterwards, which, which was for lo on loan, I thought, you don't see it with your normal eyes. You don't see it that close. So I really was longing to see it again through the film because you get so much closer. And um, 
Well, I think that's 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 a very important thing to have a crew that's so, you know, cameraman that's so feels exactly what to do and getting so close to the paintings. So how did uh, Rembrandt's use of light in painting affect the way that you shot the film? Um, I think that we're all, always very aware of light and dark. I mean, that's, yeah. that's what a cameraman does. So we're always working to get the right light. And I think that might not have been so much connected to Rembrandt. Some other things were, but this is what you normally do. Like some of people said that if Rembrandt would have lived now, that he would have been a, a great filmer. Mm -hmm. Because if, if one thing he's good at, it, it's, it's, it's light and dark. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I think that's, that's goes with the job actually to, to look at the light and to look at how it works. On, on cinema. Well, Dean mentioned that opening sequence with, uh, with the castle that I think just perfectly sets the stage and gets to that light and dark. Yeah. Yes, I love that opening also very much myself. It's, uh, and it also mirrors the, the painting uh, from the Duke of Pocuse too, because the, the light is coming from below and up and illuminating the face and it, the way that it's so close uh, to the uh, side of the castle and really casting that shadow in there too. It's just a light yeah. shadow in there. It's just, it, it's a perfect mirror, I think too. It was, I, but, absolutely. But that, was, that was really getting a present because the atmosphere in the castle, I mean, it's going in, it's like going into a time machine and it's, it's really like, it's almost spooky, but it's so beautiful. So we, it was really like a pleasure to, to have the opportunity to, to film in a castle like that. Okay. That kind of gets to the heart of the next question, which because the film shows this incredibly powerful relationship between these paintings and the owners of these works of art that are in private collections, sort of like for the pleasure of one, right? Um, given the importance the art historical importance of Rembrandt's work. What is your take on how is the art better? I mean, this is totally subjective, but um, is the art better served being in a museum where it can be shared with a larger public? Um, I know that's a really a bit of a minefield of a question, but I would love to get both of your perspectives. Um, what do you think? Ladies first. No, no. <laughs> um, I think I think uh, to be honest with iconic pieces like the the, the lady re reading or or my ancestor, you could argue that uh, that as many as people should see it and should 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 be able to visit these uh, these paintings. And I. I love art and I'm an art historian, so I, I do get that. But on the other hand, um, as Uke mentioned earlier, in the 17th century, these pictures were painted for the private market. Mm -hmm. And to see them in their sort of original background is, is quite something, as I am very f familiar with. Um, in case of the, the, the discovery, or both discoveries, we, we didn't know these pictures. So nobody really has seen them in the public domain. So effectively, nothing has changed so far. I think that it might change if they would go on loan for a very long time and they start to become sort of a household uh, icon. But for the moment, I don't think they're there yet. And the other thing is that Rembrandts are so important that most of these pictures will end up in museums or will end up going on long-term loan, like the Duke of Sutherland, he has lent his self-portrait of Rembrandt for a very long time. Um, and in the, in, in, I think in the end, in, in probably 100 years or 200 years, every old mask will probably end up in the museum anyway. So it's a matter of time. And I don't think that pictures at this level will really get damaged or destroyed anymore. So it's, yeah. it's just a matter of time. Well, what I would like to add to Jan is that um, many, I think when you go to the Jan Six house, where the painting is uh, painting of the ancestor of Jan is hanging. 
it's such an incredible experience. I don't think any museum, you know, can can uh, over over go there because it's it's coming in a home where painting is hanging. It's more authentic than a museum. Uh, so I love that. I think we should really keep houses like that. It's it's, it's amazing. the original context. Exactly. That's what I mean. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the other thing is that in most museums, it, normally, not now during Corona, but normally it's so crowded. If you want to see the Milkmaid or the Mona Lisa, that's impossible. So then you could argue, if you hang it in a sort of a house where it's less easy to go, that if you get there, it is really a trip. Um, but anyway, you know, uh, I'm, I'm probably also a bit biased. <laughs> <laughs> um. This is a question for Jan. I am curious, as far at the end of the film, you mentioned that you're on the hunt for the Abraham and Isaac painting. Have you, are you still searching for other paintings that can be attributed to Rembrandt? I'm sure the search is always ongoing. Uh, what can I say? Um, <laughs> I, I think I'm never finished. And I think we're all never finished. I think that, I hope that one of the, 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 the things that came out of this movie is that, more people are actually waking up because uh, there are pictures out there. And yeah. um, if you look at the last 10 years, I think mostly also because of Tom Kaplan, um, the school of Rembrandt has become so important and these paintings have become so uh, expensive because people are starting to understand that actually the, the core of Rembrandt has been challenged and researched, but you know, the, the, the pictures that have been overlooked for 400 years are actually very interesting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with new um, technical research and uh, big data, we start to understand that actually we don't know everything. And so, um, I, no, I, I would be lying if I would say, this is it, I'm there. No, I think, I think the hunt just started. It's just so much fun. That said, what's the status of the two Rembrandt paintings that you are working on in the film? Well, due to Corona, everything is, is Stop. stopped. And I personally, you know, I'd love it to be in museum, both of them in museums. Well, first of all, the, the Christ and the children went to uh, Lakal in Leiden and afterwards to Oxford for the young Rembrandt exhibition. But that ended due to Corona and the extension of the the exhibition was not really promising because everything stopped anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so that picture is now back at the restorer and it will be probably on, be on the restoration for another year, I think. Um, and the Port of the Young Man is now in London. And um, status quo is that we can't do anything. And it's actually quite sad because I would love it to be in an exhibition or on permanent loan or that somebody would actually buy it and then uh, lend it out or hang it above a fireplace, but that something happens with it. But it's just a waiting game. Yeah. And I've got a, a last question uh, for, for Uka before we open it up uh, to other questions um, um, from other people who've joined the call today. If you uh, have a question, if you could put it into uh, the chat, um, uh, I'll circle around to, to ask those afterwards. But Uka, uh, I would like to know what, uh, what is your next film project? Well, actually, I'm working on a couple of films, but uh, one you, one we, you won't be surprised about. It's um, uh, when I ended uh, my Rembrandt, uh, the, the museums, the Rijks Museum started to work on a research and a restoration of the Night Watch, and they asked me to make a film on that. So, what can you say? You don't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So that's one. And the other one, you might be surprised, but uh, I'm also working on a film on my uh, Jewish mother uh, who passed away in August, but I was working for this film on more than 10 years. And, and, and it's about how she dealt with the Second World War on a daily basis when she grew old. And that's a very personal film. So mm -hmm. I'm very much looking forward to bringing that out. Mm -hmm. 
thank you so much to uh, Uka and Jan uh, for sharing your insights about the film too. And uh, if you haven't seen it yet too, it is still streaming on the Speed's virtual cinema platform too. It, um, and uh, we'll have it up for a few more weeks as well, uh, available uh, through the Speed. Um, and I wanna thank you again both for uh, sharing your great insights too.